Yeah, I'm good. Sorry, Ted's just barking in the background. He's looking out the window, but um, oh, that's okay. That's one of the perks. <laughs> that's one of the perks of like doing these chats and having dogs is that um, they end up yeah. being part of the conversation, which is super fun. Um, so, hi, I am so glad that you're able to join today, and I'm yeah, really excited right. to meet you face to face as we've followed each other on Instagram for a while now. Um, yeah. Did you want to, for people who don't know, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm Sophie White. Um, I'm a veterinary surgeon based in the UK um, and I'm also a clinical animal behaviourist. So in the UK, when I think also in the US mainly, we refer to ourselves as veterinary behaviourists. So that's with additional behaviour qualifications. Um, I work completely in behaviour now. I do all behaviour referrals from like first opinion general practice vets. Um, and I'm also a um, trustee for the Animal Behaviour and Training Council, which is a charity in the UK, which is hoping to be well, working towards being a regulatory body. Um, it's currently a voluntary body. And so you don't have to join. But the idea is that it will grow in popularity and end up being a regulatory body for hopefully all of the behaviour and trainers in the UK. Wow, that's amazing. That is incredible. I know that here in the United States, um, particularly right now, it's very, very, very hard to get an appointment with a veterinary behaviorist <laughs> because they're kind of far between and because yeah. so many people got a dog um, during the pandemic. And now as the world sort of goes back to normal, people are, are recognizing that they have some serious um, behavioral challenges with their animals. Mm. Uh, so everyone's trying to book with a, a veterinary behaviorist and it can be like months and months and months out. Is, is it sort of the same situation in the UK? Yeah, so um, my between like um, colleagues and friends, I've got the pet behaviorists. My waiting list is relatively good because I'm a bit more, um, I'm not in a big city. So I'm probably about six to eight weeks at the moment, <clears throat> which is quite good. Um, it goes up to kind of about three months and I really try and keep it below that. But certainly lots of people are above. Um, there are very, very few like, big behavior referral places in the UK. So um, like a few of the referral centers that are based at universities and things have referral options for behavior, but they're very limited. Um, the nearest one to me, um, last time I'm aware, it was booking at nine months in advance, which oh. essentially essentially means it's not really taking new clients because it's, it's it, you can't really, no one's gonna wait nine months. Right. So yeah, it's really busy. Um, there's only about, um, actually, as part of the ABTC, I, I was doing something recently to try and send out um, email information to all the veterinary behaviourists in the UK, which is quite hard because there's not like one register because it's still even, it's not that tightly controlled at the moment. There's quite a few ways you can do it. Um, I think I came up with about 35 vets that practice clinical behaviour in the UK. Um, but quite a few of those work in research or they might work as part of like a bigger clinic. So there's probably only about 25 or so that people can actually see privately. That's wild. That's such a small network of people for yeah. such like a huge problem that people are experiencing. Yeah, luckily we have growing numbers of clinical animal behaviorists. So essentially they will have um, the same training as the veterinary behaviorists will, just kind of minus the veterinary background, but their okay. behavioral approach will be just the same. Um, yeah. but they would sort of need to say, okay, well, I think there might be something medical. You need to see your vet, or I think medication might be helpful. You need to see your vet. Whereas of course the benefit of being a veterinary behaviorist is we can kind of just swap hats and be like, Absolutely. I think there's something medical. I think it's this, which obviously, um, the clinical animal behaviorists have to be, um, a bit more strained about and make sure they refer on. Wow. That's amazing. So what made you decide to move more so into behavior than into practicing like surgery? Um, yeah, so I was in general practice, so like first opinion general practice for um, about seven or eight years before I did my master's in clinical animal behavior. And um, I'd always moved around quite a bit. I hadn't kind of quite found my niche. Um, but I really enjoyed doing um, pain management, particularly like chronic pain management stuff. So I did acupuncture and I did a, a diploma in sort of myotherapy, so like soft tissue therapy. Um, so I was seeing quite a lot of animals who had chronic pain conditions. Um, 
And I really enjoyed that. And I think through that, I started to see more and more links between pain and behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, Actually, the vet that ran my acupuncture course I did was, um, is a veterinary behaviorist and she runs a pain and behavior clinic. Um, She now works at one of the veterinary universities in Scotland. So she was kind of the first person I'd sort of seen that was like a vet that did behavior and then she did both. So I guess from the beginning, my entrance to kind of behavior was always that they were together. So I'd never really, I'd never come into behavior from like a training background or anything like that. I came from it very much from the veterinary background and the medical route. Yeah. Um, And then I got asked my second dog around that same sort of time where I was thinking like, I'm really quite interested in behavior. It really intrigues me. And then we got our second dog who is um, a challenge. (laughs) So he's sort of my muse. And I sort of thought, I probably should know what to do about this because this is the sort of thing that people ask me about all the time in practice. Uh, I don't know what to do for myself. I should probably know. So at least I can tell my clients. Um, And yeah, it kind of went from there. I was like, well, I need to learn more. And then I found it really interesting. And it just kind of went from there. That's so cool. It is super, super interesting. I, um, well, since getting bunny, she is, has proven to be something of a challenging dog as well, as well as a a brilliant and amazing, wonderful companion, um, just sort of inspired me to, uh, learn as much as I can about behavior and about the different approaches that people take towards managing reactivity and addressing fear and reactivity based behaviors. Um, Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I have, have uh, determined is that when you experience reactivity, the first thing you should do is speak to a vet. Like that's the very first thing. Um, so do you have a lot of people, I mean, you're, you're primarily focused on behavior right now. So do you have people booking appointments with you primarily because their animal is aggressive or reactive or what is sort of the first, what are, what's the majority of the cases that you're, that you're seeing right now that you're helping people with? Um, yeah, so I have a particular interest and I sort of advertise my interest in human directed aggression. Mm. So I'm very happy to work with dogs um, say, who have aggression, particularly directed towards people, but that might be directed towards other dogs and things as well. Um, I do work with other species, but probably 99% of my work is with dogs. Um, okay. And yeah, I think um, reactivity, which is a really interesting fa- uh, phrase, um, yeah. is a really, really big presenting problem as well as um normally what turns out to be resource guarding so normally um, Mm. aggression towards family as well is another big reason I know lots of my colleagues are doing lots and lots of separation um, related distress um, and separation related problems I see less of that but I think that's probably just because there are people who again advertise themselves as really being interested in that area um, so it's probably just that people are finding their way to them. I do see separation related problems, definitely. Um, and a lot of my patients who struggle with aggressive behaviours and sort of aggressive tendencies, one of the management issues we have is they don't like being alone. So if your dog can't go places with you because it tends to utilise aggression, and it's not comfortable, you need to be able to leave it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So often we end up doing quite a lot of separation work, making sure they're comfortable even though it's not the primary presenting problem. Yeah. Do you find that people come to you as a sort of last resort? Like they've gone to um, trainers or behavior consultants first that hadn't been able to help them. And maybe those trainers or behavior consultants have said, I think you should see a veterinary behaviorist um, and potentially investigate like medical uh, behavior medicine, that sort of thing. Or Yeah, it's really varied. So I've got a few um, really great um trainers and behaviorists who in my local area who might contact me and say I don't know what's going on (laughs) can I send them to you and it's like yeah of course which is fantastic when we've got um people referring on and I always try and then include them um so like if they want to kind of partake in the process going forwards and be kept up to date and the owner's happy with that then I think that's really nice to work as that team um I've got quite a lot of vets who Um, are keen to refer to me and they might have clients maybe that present a problem and either ask the vet or they might kind of mention in passing that they're seeing somebody and it's not working or mention some things that maybe concern the vet and they might kind of be like okay maybe you should see someone a bit more qualified um, Mm -hmm. or using different methods and refer to me Um, 
but also I do have clients who um, are just getting better educated. Um, I've had a few clients who have made mistakes in the past in terms of who they've selected and have realized that they went down a wrong route and really weren't happy. So they've then gone away and put a lot of kind of time and effort into researching what methods and what routes they do want. And that's great to me, you know, when people are so proactively going, right, okay, I actually need to, you know, seek out that help. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, obviously people explore as many different methods as it takes. Um, and what, I, what I'm seeing a lot of in my very sort of <clears throat> narrow focus is, is people trying perhaps the balanced approach and it's not giving them exactly what they need and then trying a more force-free approach. And sometimes that's not necessarily the answer either. And then, you know, like at their wits end, sort of what, what else can I try? I don't know what else to do. And I remember growing up, there was such a stigma against like even going to therapy as a human, right? It was like, oh, you've got like major problems if, if you're in therapy. And now it's like, you've got problems if you're not in therapy. And I think <laughs> the same thing is sort of true of behavioral medication, right? It was yeah. so sort of shunned for somebody to be on like a Prozac or a Paxil. Um, as I was growing up, it's like, wow, they must be like really, wow. and now I feel like everyone is on some form of anti-anxiety medication, not only because the world is a very anxiety inducing place, but because they help. Right. So mm -hmm. why is there such a stigma still towards animals being, um, well, not in therapy. I mean, like dog training is not, you know, there's not a stigma around it. So dogs can be in therapy. That's okay. But still, if someone's like, I think my dog might need to be on a behavioral medication, people are like, oh, it's a cop out or, oh, that's no, no, no. Why would you do that? What do you, what are your feelings about that? I think there's definitely some kind of societal differences as well, because I definitely think in America, there's a bit of a different problem from what I tend to pick up from people. And I've spoken to on a few other podcasts about um, with um, American trainers and things about behavior meds. But in America, it seems like kind of everyone's, you know, having a Xanax when, they, when life gets a bit stressful. Um, yeah. And I think there can sort of be the tendency maybe to misuse medication in as much mm -hmm. as not necessarily understanding why you're giving it. And the problem then is you're going to use it in situations where it's not going to work. So people might be like, oh, well, I tried meds and they didn't work. Well, yeah, because you were using something that made no sense for what your problem was. Like or, the wrong, the wrong medication. Yeah. Or, or you tried, you know, you tried one drug. But there's lots of different ones, and the, you know, maybe what we're talking about are totally different. So I think, um, yes, definitely in America, I think it is a bit more on board with behavior meds. But mm -hmm. I think if I was prescribing in America, I, I would imagine your vet behavior has still come up with kind of different problems that people probably will have tried things but won't really have necessarily thought it through. It might be a bit more like, oh well, you know, we'll have a drug. And see if that helps. Um, whereas in the UK, I think and maybe it's maybe in certain parts of the US as well, but I think a lot of it seems to come from that people feel like that animal's going to be drugged, like sedated. Um, yeah. And I think that's probably because of things we used to use. So you know, when we think about um, like firework fears and things like that, or difficulty traveling, which are kind of you know really common things that animals go to the vets for. Um, mm -hmm we used to use really inappropriate drugs that just basically knocked them out. It was like, well, if, they, if they're basically asleep, they won't notice what's going on. So I totally understand why people wouldn't want that. But also that's not what we would want to be doing now either. So I think it's really important that people understand what you're giving and why you're giving it. Um, and I do think the rise in human medication can be helpful because if you relate that to people, most people know someone on medication and of course there are some people who don't get on with certain medications or maybe some people with really severe mental illness that might have to be on a lot of medication and they, and they maybe don't feel themselves but the vast majority of people are absolutely fine and she's you say better than they were before happier than they were before yeah. um, being on the medication so I think that's always helpful to be able to draw that parallel I think the more human um, mental health and mental well-being um, comes to the forefront I think that's really helpful to then reflect back on our pets and sort of get people to draw that parallel so how then do you know in a behavior case um 
when a medication might be useful or not? Like, how do you draw that line? Like, let's try this medication versus let's try this behavior modification plan without medication. I think it's always a really individual decision, but I guess the first things we need to think about are risk assessments. Are um, owners, uh, the public, other animals, all the animals themselves in immediate danger? You know, we might have animals that are performing um, kind of self injurious repetitive behaviors. So it might have dogs that are chewing their tails or spinning and making themselves really painful, biting bars, that kind of thing where they, they're injuring themselves. Um, so obviously we need to stop that as soon as we can. Um, we might also say have risk where it's really, really hard to manage in the home or out and about. So we need improvement quick. Yeah. Um, we also might be in that situation because like you mentioned before, owners, this is their last shot. So sometimes owners kind of come to you and they're like, we need improvement soon, or that's kind of end game. Yeah. So often we'll be like, okay, have everything, <laughs> you know, like let's just try and get this improved and then we can pick it apart and work out what's helping. But ultimately, if we think there's a chance, a good chance of improving that dog's well-being and quality of life, we want to make sure we can get there quick enough before the owners have, have given up. And often there's a really long road for them. You know, often I don't blame them for giving up. They've normally been working at these things for a long time and they just can't cope. Um, but also we need to think about, do we have a starting point? So sometimes I speak to clients and I'm like, okay, well, what distance does your dog react to the triggers? Mm -hmm. And they're like literally on site. And particularly depending like where they live, you, yeah. The furthest distance available to them may be over threshold. Right. So, and, you know, yes, we can think about breaking the stimulus down. Yes, we can think about introducing like sounds and smells and building it all up. But sometimes. But the environment is the environment. Like yeah, sometimes and, you just can't manage a, a certain yeah. environment. Yeah. And I think particularly when we have people that live in sort of built up areas and cities and things, there's usually either no trigger or the trigger's right there. You know, it walks around the corner yeah. and it's. A few you know a few meters away or it's around the other side of a building and you can't see it there's and no that's why it's so like detrimental to the um handlers mental health as well yeah because you're it's constantly really... like, expecting a trigger yeah and know how to manage can't change the environment and yeah. you can't really prepare for those unavoidable like person right. around the corner yes or no today who knows dog stays inside i'm not going to take that chance because it's too stressful yeah. to the dog and to myself and the quality of life of both people suffers because of that yeah, exactly. And as I say, you know, I do sometimes get people as well where they have learned how to manage it. So as you said, they might take their dog to an enclosed field or to the countryside and walk on the weekends, but during the yeah. week they don't go out. But they want to know how they go from that. Like, is there a chance, is there a way for them to actually get back to maybe more normality? Um, and that's often where, you know, we need medication. If there's no starting point, if you can't get a foothold on that ladder, Drugs can be a really good boost just to kind of get you there. Mm -hmm. um, we sometimes see that with things like noise sensitivities as well. You know, if you can't have a noise being played at like the lowest volume your equipment can go, if the dog's already freaking out about that, yeah. you can't do noise desensitization. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, we put drugs on board and then we can do it. And then over time we remove that medication, but the dog's more able to cope because it's already learned things with the help of the medication. Well, cool. that's interesting. Um, yeah, I hadn't really thought about that, that sort of system. I was going to ask, do you typically find that um, a dog who needs a behavioral medication has to stay on that medication long term? Or is it frequently something that you will be on for a period of time so that learning can happen? You can put some behaviors in the operant yeah. realm and then um, wean off of the medication. So we've got sort of two main groups of medication as well. We've got our situational and our long-term. So our situational might be things like they need to go to the vets and the vet that just can't handle the vets <clears throat> yeah. or they need to be groomed, they need to go in the car, et cetera. So those sort of medications, often we would try and use them to help us with training and then wean them off. But for some dogs, we know that some activities are just totally unrealistic. They are mm -hmm. never, ever going to do that thing happily. Or maybe there is so much else going on. It's just not a priority. If we can just give them the drugs and, it, and they cope, great. Totally. 
because actually their owner and they need to focus so much on all the other things in their life that they can't just take drugs and cope with that it's fine. So sometimes say situational meds may be either. And I say sometimes it's just a case of, well, if the situational meds make it better and you only go to the vets every six months, mm-hmm. well, let's just put that on the back burner. It doesn't really matter. If this helps you cope, go with it. Sure. Um, when we think about long-term meds, I'd always suggest that's things we might take daily and we plan to take for a longer period. Personally, I always suggest people don't start them unless they're willing to at least six months mm. because we really don't want really up and down. You know, we're altering their neurotransmitters. We're altering the way they feel. We don't want to be on and off all over the place. And a lot of um, times on those meds, you don't even see a difference until like two months in sometimes, right? Exactly. We normally say about kind of four to six weeks for most of those drugs, sometimes a bit longer, is when you're expecting to really be able to see what's happening. So we need to really commit to that. And then I usually say to people, I wouldn't consider consider weaning off until you've had three months of kind of steady behavior at the level that you need and works for the animal. Hmm. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be perfect, but if they're happy and the owner is and the guardian is happy with that level, it's good enough. Then let's make sure that stays static for three months. And then we start a really slow wean. Normally slower than you need from a medical perspective. Sure. Because what we don't want to do is sometimes people are very optimistic and they're like, yeah, we're going to be fine without meds. And then all the meds come off and they suddenly realize they might have had their rose tinted spectacles on and the, the problem's back. So we take yeah. it nice and slow and make sure we track for any signs of things recurring. Behavior is so, lessened because of the meds. <laughs> so, yeah. Right? So yeah. the majority of patients will come off meds. Um I've got a client at the moment who's nearly off and her dog will have just about done a year. Um, and they're really, really happy with progress. Um, some dogs might be on less. But I would, I guess about a year is probably kind of average. Um, that being said, there are some animals that need behavior meds for life because they are just not made for this environment. Um, it might be that they're not made for their environment. Maybe they live in a completely unsuitable area. And it's all well and good saying, well, rehome them, but they may have very specific needs. They may benefit a huge amount from being in that environment with that family, but the environment doesn't work for them. Um, So, yes, it would be lovely if we could rehome them and they didn't need meds. But actually, if that's not possible, then it's fine. And some dogs are just not made for anywhere in this world you know our world is mad and is totally some, mad. Some, some dogs are just not made for it like human existence is 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 totally beyond them and very weird and drugs just make them be able to enjoy their life a lot better and without it they just find it really difficult yeah yeah as a lot of people do yeah <laughs> like you said the world the thing, is totally it, mad <laughs> if it helps them enjoy it and it's like it just helps them feel better kind of suited and and they can actually sort of fit in better um then why not you know as long as they're not suffering significant side effects if it overall improves their welfare then they can stay on it as long as they need awesome um what do you so once a family with their animal has found the right medication what sort of changes in behavior do you sort of expect to see at that six week mark that a person could look at and be like, oh, this drug is working or, oh, this drug is not working? I think it really, really depends on the case. Um, and it really depends what you're trying to achieve with the medication. Mm-hmm. So, um, for example, when we use things like uh, fluoxetine, so Prozac, we might be thinking, you know, in for one dog, we might be using that because they are extremely fearful. They have a really high sensitivity to threat. So they might, for example, be uh, really avoidant of cars. They might be very sensitive to novelty and things. So I tend to set up shared diaries with my clients and I ask them just to score every day on like a one to five. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how bad was their noise sensitivity today? How bad was this today? How good was it? Um, What was their overall mood like? Um, We also might track things like appetite or... um, We see lots of um, issues with mobility and digestive problems alongside a lot of these things. We might track things like that. Mm -hmm. So if you're giving the medication because they are generally fearful, we would hope that 
their fears would start to be a little bit better. So they might maybe be a bit more willing or maybe just a bit more engaged if you're trying to do some very basic training with them, maybe just doing some desensitization or some counter conditioning, they might just be able to engage with you a bit more. They don't reach that over threshold level as quickly in yeah. environments. Yeah, and you might just see that they seem to be a bit more relaxed. They seem to be a little bit happier day to day, maybe just not quite so worried about stuff. Um, equally, I use fluoxetine quite a lot for dogs that struggle with frustration. Can be quite mm. good at helping moderate frustration levels. So in those sort of dogs, we might see things like less demand barking, less like mouthing and chewing and like pulling at owners, um, less things like humping bedding or digging, trying to dig in the carpet and those sort of things. Um, depending on the dog, what we want to try and do is give owners objective things they can measure because they think behavior has a sort of reputation as being a bit wishy-washy. But actually, you can you can generate measurable data if you know what you're looking for. By sort of like tracking, okay, here's a month's worth of uh, behaviors that I've seen on a scale of like one to 10, yeah. uh, fearfulness, uh, doesn't seem happy, aggression, how they're eating, track that for like a month before the meds and yeah. for them like six to eight weeks after the meds and just sort of measure the differences. Yeah, exactly. If we can get baseline in before, that would be amazing. I say, or at least we get it on while um, they're on medication. And sometimes, particularly when we're doing things like pain trials, so rather than using behavior modifying medication, we're using pain relief because we feel like pain might be contributing to their behavior. It's not always that clear because often we'll have changed other things. We might have changed their management things. So sometimes you don't know what's making them better. So again, tracking them, maybe withdrawing the pain relief and tracking. And then if they start to get worse, we put them back on and they get better again. Brilliant. That really confirms our suspicions. But we don't only use behavior modifying medication in as much as sort of our psychoactive medications. Um, we'll often do pain trials as well. So a lot of my patients might be started on pain relief for a minimum of a month and sometimes multiple types of pain relief because we feel like there is a strong suspicion of pain. There might be evidence already. So we might have a dog with a limp or a dog that gets stiff, etc. Or there might just be indicators from the behaviour that we have an inkling that pain is, is a playing a part. Interesting. Um, and if there's pain there, you're never going to get any further. Right. Because if we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, so how we sort of think about what kind of level <laughs> we need to progress, <laughs> Otter's like, I need to buck. Um, Bunny, Bunny got a little mad at Otter there. <laughs> was like, like, Bunny you telling was him like, off. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if we think about what levels in kind of that Maslow's hierarchy sort of um, image depiction, um, you need to have your kind of, um, physical safety and health, first of all. If you feel physically injured, in danger, et cetera, you're never gonna get to the point where you can learn new skills and think about stuff. Your brain doesn't care about learning new skills or listening to anyone else. It cares about surviving and staying safe. Yeah. So we really, really need to address that pain before we can go anywhere. And that's sometimes why people have made no progress before. You can have yeah. an amazing behaviorist if they've missed the factor in pain or you're ill, you might not be going anywhere. Yeah. So, so we look at that and we monitor that and that can be really, really helpful. And sometimes we don't know where we're looking. <laughs> so we might see that we've got evidence of pain in as much as the animal improves with pain relief and deteriorates when you stop it, improves when you start it again. Then that's where we need to kind of think, okay, what's the most likely place? Let's go looking. Um, but there was a really nice review article, I keep saying last year, I feel like it might be two years ago now, which was looking at um, across Europe, might have had some of the centres in the States, but I think it was Europe, looking at um, big referral centres, so mainly universities. And it was looking about the prevalence of underlying painful conditions in animals that were referred, um, as well as, you know, that was not including non-painful medical conditions. So they, there were some of those as well on top. 
absolute minimum was 30% of cases had underlying pain. In some centres, that was up to 80% of cases were found to have um, a source of pain when they were referred. Wow. So um, uh, going back to uh, the vet I mentioned who taught me acupuncture, she had a pain and behaviour clinic, and she said that in her clinic, there was about a 50% overlap. Her, what the patients would be referred to one of her departments and then end up being seen by both in about 50% of cases. 50% overlap is between like pain and aggression. Pain and behavior, yeah. But aggression, particularly. That's so there's a very strong link between pain and aggression and also pain and noise sensitivity. They're probably the two biggest um, groups. I mean, that totally resonates with me. I know that if I have a headache, any sound is going to drive me bonkers. And if I'm not feeling well at all, um, mm. I'm more sensitive to everything. Um, that's so interesting, though, because I, I wouldn't have thought like, <clears throat> I guess I would have thought you go to a veterinarian, uh, you find a source of pain, and then you prescribe pain medications. I feel like that's the way it happens in like human medicine, right? But it makes a lot of sense that not always are we going to be able to identify because they can't, our dogs can't talk necessarily, yeah. um, can't identify where they're in pain. So we just try, like maybe you are in pain, you seem like you're in pain, perhaps we can't diagnose exactly why, but we might be able to help you by just reducing that pain or just yeah. trialing and seeing if pain medication reduces behavior problems. That's so that's yeah. That's sort of because of course, of course, we present we self present for medical care, <laughs> whereas obviously our pets right. don't. <laughs> so we've got to know there's a problem to take them in the first place. Um, but also, it's really really important that we accept the limitations of what you find on clinical exam. Yeah, not every animal is going to tell you how they feel. And when we go to the vets, your stress hormones are elevated. So your epinephrine and norepinephrine and cortisol, they all go up. And one of the whole points of those is to help you escape danger. They mm -hmm. feed your fight flight response. That is why dogs maybe that are chasing will often cut themselves and keep running. They, horses will keep running on a broken leg because their stress hormones push you to go through that danger and keep going. Yeah. So when you go to the vets, you don't respond to pain as much. You don't feel pain as much really because you're in that heightened state. So yes, yeah. we can poke and prod. Sometimes they just don't say anything. Um, but also, uh, you know, like we can probably relate to, say like if you've got a headache or if you've got a backache, you can poke it. It doesn't necessarily hurt. Sometimes mm -hmm. it just hurts. Um, uh. There's a really great quote from someone called Margot McCaffrey, who's a human nurse, who which says, you know, that pain is whatever the patient says it is, experience whenever the patient says it is. Yeah. And there's only so much we can say. I always encourage vets, you know, to, in their notes and when they think about things, is that you cannot identify pain in that patient at this point. That does not mean they're not painful. Totally. Um, yeah. you know, we, we can't tell them they're not painful. Um, we just need to look for evidence and we may feel we get to a point where we're pretty confident they're not because we've ruled out quite a lot and we've kind of worked through that process of trying things and it doesn't influence their behavior. Interesting. So are you more likely to um, initially prescribe a pain medication of some sort than a, a behavioral medication? I would prefer to. So again, like we mentioned, sometimes we're at, you know, last chance saloon, in which case, yeah. chuck it all off. Last chance saloon. Um, particularly because pain relief tends to, not in all cases, but it tends to work quicker than behavior modifying medication. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you might find that you start both at the same time, but you might find if they improve in a week, that's probably not the behavior meds. That's too quick, really. That's so um, interesting. But we can always work backwards. You know, say so we can chuck everything in there and if the animal's doing really well, well then we start picking it apart and we take away one thing and see how they do. Because people yeah. often hesitate to do everything at once because they're like, well, how will we know? Yeah, totally. And part of my response to that normally is, why does it matter? You know, like right now, like we just we're want here because her. people are desperate and the animals yeah. are desperate. Who yeah. cares why it works? Let's see if it works. And then we can pick it apart afterwards and work it out. That's not as important right now. But yes, personally, if at all possible, if I've got a suspicion of pain, or um, not necessarily, um, although the vast majority of um, psychoactive medication, so behavior modifying medication, is really safe and actually 
has much lower side effects than quite a lot of other medications. Um, of course, there are potential for side effects with anything. Um, and we use fluoxetine a lot, so Prozac, and one of the most common side effects with that is inappetence and gastrointestinal upset. That's usually within the first two weeks. So most patients, we can kind of just give them some TLC and get them through that. You know, they might want some bit of special dinner or they might want a bit of hand feeding or maybe just need to make it a bit more exciting and put in some food enrichment. And they might be a little bit sicky, or have a bit of a loose bum, but nothing major. In which case we would just keep going until we're through that two weeks and normally it settles. Oh, okay. Um, but sometimes we have dogs who just can't tolerate it. Um, they just, they won't eat anything or they really feel really nauseous, have really bad upset times. Um, and sometimes we just decide it's not really worth it. You know, it's not worth making them feel awful. Um, or it really continues past that two weeks point and we start thinking, okay, this isn't just adjusting to the medication. The medication obviously doesn't suit them. Yeah. Um, and that can be more common as well when we've got patients who already have pre-existing gastrointestinal problems. So there's you- often other medications we can try. So that might be something we consider. You know, if we've got a patient who we know has gastrointestinal disease or we know they're very picky with their food, like I've seen lots of your videos about like trying to get Bunny to eat things, you probably wouldn't put her necessarily on floxetine because there's a relatively high chance of inappetence. Um, you might use other similar things. Um, there's other SSRIs that tend to have a similar end effect, but maybe a little bit easier on the gastrointestinal tract. Interesting. Um, this part will chop out because I'm not telling my audience this yet, but Bunny is actually on Prozac. Um, how's, it, how's it suiting her? Um, I have definitely seen a softening in her behavior. Um, yeah. And her food related issues persist. But I think some of that is just like a behavior chain that I have created because I started making her <laughs> Right. It's like, oh, um, I started making her crock pot food and then she went and stayed with my my parents for a week. And they're yeah. like, she eats a full plate of food every morning, no problem. And then I'm like, She's got you well trained. <laughs> what? She's got you well trained. She's got me well trained. And then um I come back and she's like, No, I'm not gonna eat this unless you like put it in my mouth fistful by fistful. Um, so it's clearly something, some behavior chain that I've created. Um but her, her gut does seem to be doing a little bit better. But I was curious about that because um, some of my behavior consultant friends are like, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure why they put her on Prozac because it's probably exacerbating her pre-existing gastrointestinal issues. Um, I often try it. I often say yeah. to people, let's give it a go. I've had very few we need to take it off. Um, mm-hmm. But I came across literally this weekend, um, floxamine, which I've actually never heard of. Um, which is more common in Europe. So I was dealing with a client who's, uh, the dog was born in Switzerland. They lived in Switzerland for a few years before they came here. So they started on floxamine in Switzerland. Um, And when I looked it up, it actually tends to have less gastrointestinal side effects than floxetine and and is recommended in some papers as an alternative um, for dogs with sensitive tummies. So you're always learning something new. Yeah. Um, Yeah, you can often often work around the tummy upsets. And I say they don't always happen. Some dogs are yeah. absolutely fine on it. Yeah. Um, um, you can probably hear a weird noise in the background. Um, <laughs> it's an ice cream I can't, van. I can't hear anything. Good. <laughs> There's yeah. a weird chiming in the background because an ice cream van has just come past with it. That's adorable. Playing, I love it. Let's, let's, awesome. Jamil, let's like boost that sound <laughs> in the final because that's really cute. Um, so interesting. So, okay, here's another question. What, oh, Otter's going to start barking because Bunny has got him trapped in the bedroom. She's just like staring at him like, you can't come out. And now he's frustrated. Can you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> um, how do you know, like, how would you know at what point to increase a dosage? Like, say you're, you've seen some, um, you've seen some improvement. Like you've seen a softening in general demeanor. They seem a little bit uh, generally a little bit more happy, a little bit less fearful, a little bit um, staying under threshold a little bit more. Um, At what point do you say, uh, we're not quite where we want to be. We need to increase this dosage versus let's start trying to act on some of these operant behaviors that we could implement 
um, to change the behavior? At what point are you like more medicine, uh, more behavior modification, like more training, more medicine? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think a lot of that comes down to making sure the client is realistic. You know, sometimes clients feel like, oh, not much has happened. And I might feel like exactly what I thought was going to happen has happened. <laughs> you know, and actually I'm really pleased. <laughs> right. Because your behavior, your behavior meds are not going to solve your problem. Um, right, right. Your pain relief is probably not going to solve your problem because there's going to be lots of learned aspects of your behavior as well. So we have to be realistic with what we're actually expecting from our drugs. Um, you're still going to have to do the behavior you want. So we can't necessarily just increase it and hope the behavior gets, you know, endlessly better. Um, if the client isn't doing the behavior modification work, why? And that might be because they still can't get it going. In which case we need to think about, have we really split this down into small enough chunks? Right. Can we simplify it? Can we make it easier either for them and or for their pet? It can be so um, You know, or as you say, are we still not at starting point? Are we still not in a space where we can start? In which case we need to think about, is there room to increase? You know, where are we in our dose range? Can we go mm -hmm. up? Um, or actually, do we feel like we're pretty maxed out? And we want to think about adding something else. Um, we want to think about whether we've seen any improvement, because sometimes it's difficult. If you don't feel you've seen any improvement, I would be tempted yeah. to try and increase your dose and see if you get something. And usually a dose increase tends to kick in quicker than starting from fresh. So you might want to leave it another couple of weeks. Wait, what was that last thing you said? Uh so when you increase the dose, it often starts having an effect quicker than when you originally start the medication. Oh, interesting. Um, so particularly for things like SSRI, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, part of that kind of scaling up when you start is upregulation of receptors in your brain. So once you've started, they're already upregulated and it's easier then to kind of boost the dose that's available to them. Gotcha. Um, but like, for example, I've got a client at the moment whose dog is very frustrated, very fearful, but also really struggles to control his arousal. He's a working line shepherd and he is zero mm -hmm. to like one million in about a second. <laughs> and that's if he plays, if he gets stressed, positive, negative, anything, he's just like a rocket and he's just completely mm -hmm. loses his head. <laughs> so well, he's on medication to try and reduce his frustration and his fears. And that seemed to be working, but his owners are still they're really struggling with a very, very hard dog to manage. So they were getting quite uh, restless about how long this could go on for. So we decided to increase his dose of um, floxetine, um, but also add in something called clonidine, which is a bit quicker acting. It's kind of, it's more of a situational medication that you can use every day, but its aim is to reduce arousal. So it's not about positive or negative emotions, um, it basically aims at shifting your sort of uh, fight flight to your rest and digest. So your sympathetic nervous system tries to tone that down um, by reducing your noradrenaline levels. So you can use those together. And when we think about problem behaviors, we need to think about, is the problem emotional? Is, in it, is it the valence? You know, is it the animal is feeling a negative emotion when they should be feeling neutral or positive? Or yeah. is it actually arousal? We might have some problem behaviors where the dog thinks their life is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, this is <laughs> never. But it still causes a problem because, you know, they might be getting really rough. They might be hurting people. They might be doing all sorts. But we don't, we don't want them to feel sad. We don't need to change the emotion. We need right. to bring the level down. <laughs> and that's where, you know, that's what we want to focus our behavior mod on. But sometimes once your arousal is so high, there's nothing we can do to get in there. Your brain is gone. So using yeah. medication can help tone it down enough that we can actually start getting in there. Yeah. This dog, for example, once he's exposed to a trigger, there's no way you're getting any interaction from him. Right. So we want to reduce his tendency to react to triggers, but also take the edge off him when he does react so we can at least try and intervene and kind of offer him some guidance. Yeah, brilliant. This is so fascinating to me. Um, I uh, recently attended a seminar about the connection between gut microbiome and aggression. 
which I find super yeah. fascinating because there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of study into that correlation in humans and um, the amount of serotonin that's produced in the gut. And so yeah, I huge started, amount. Huge amount. Um, mm -hmm. So I started giving Bunny calming care, um, mm -hmm. which is something that I'd, I'd heard a lot about. And we've just started it recently, but I'm interested to see um, how and if that affects. And I also, there's um, animal, animal biome, I think it's called animal microbiome, where you can send some little poop samples from your dog to some scientists to analyze what's in their gut microbiome. Mm. Um, and then they can send you um, different concoctions of, of pre and probiotics to help yeah. balance out your animal's microbiome. But do you do anything with that? Do you, is that something that you I think it's include in your practice? Absolutely fascinating. And mm. I don't think we have enough evidence at the moment to make solid recommendations mm -hmm. but I think if there's options which owners want to invest in you know they're happy to spend money without necessarily knowing the result or quite yeah. simple changes we can make I think as long as we present it as we don't know but this yeah, isn't yeah. Har I can tell you it's not harmful and I can tell you it might work then right. I think if people want to try that and I think it's really yeah. important how we present it yeah. so I, I at the moment definitely am having a lot more conversations with owners about trying probiotics we've got a couple of commercially available veterinary probiotics in the UK adding a bit more variety maybe if I've got clients who just feed the same food maybe they just feel kibble every day mm -hmm. particularly when we think about human gut health we want lots of different variety so that's right so you know do we want to maybe start adding a little few bits and pieces to their diet as long as their gut can tolerate it that variety is probably good for their gut um, yeah. Also, we need to think about gut um, um, infections and things. And this is super difficult because we really don't want to be overusing antibiotics. Antibiotic resistance is a huge issue. Yeah. And the more you look, the more you find, and then you don't know whether to treat it or not. And it gets very complicated. But um, Giardia is a gut protozoa, which is really, really common in dogs but it often causes diarrhea and it can also cause pica, so ingestion of weird objects. Oh, yeah. And um, I find that a lot of my patients who I ask to get fecal samples done are Giardia positive. Hmm. And I think treating that, um, which actually doesn't need antibiotics, it needs an antihelmintic, um, that can have a really interesting result. I've had some dogs who actually have stopped a behavior completely when they've been treated for it. Um, so I had a dog that used to chew and hump bedding every night after dinner. I'd done it for years. When it was treated for Giardia, it stopped. It's really common to get reinfected with Giardia. And he yeah. started again a few weeks later. So his vet repeated the Giardia treatment and it stopped again. It's not come back. So I think well, there can be such strong links. And there's so many weird things that our gut does that we don't understand. Um, and I, the more I learn about gut biome and things, the more my brain just like goes off thinking about things like what I don't I don't like doing research I really wish I did because I have these weird ideas that I wish I could get the answer to <laughs> but like one of my things is with humans we believe that cesarean births may be in part responsible for increases in like allergy eczema asthma that sort of thing because right. obviously you're not having a vaginal birth you're missing that exposure to bacteria and my understanding now is actually quite a lot of cesarean births will have contact with vaginal fluids to try and kind of counteract that. Oh, interesting. Now we have lots of breeds of dog increasing in popularity where the bitches often need cesarean sections. Mm -hmm. Is that in part why we see so many dogs with skin allergies and food allergies? Is that possibly playing a role in their behavior? No, there's just, I think there's so many questions and I think there's so much we'd love to know and hopefully it will start coming through. You know, we, we need more interest in it because then there'll be more research into it and then we'll get more answers. But I think ultimately, if we can do things that are safe and we understand that we don't know if they're going to work, then great, use them as an add-on, you know, but we just don't want to pin too much hope on them without having a solid answer. It's such an interesting question. Mm. And I love all the new research that's coming out about it. And I'm going to go prevent Otter from eating something he shouldn't be. One sec. <laughs> he is a tiny terrorist. <laughs> Next time I get up early and I walk him first before <laughs> the meeting.
<laughs> okay, apologies. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by all that research and I'm fascinated by how many approaches there are to uh, working with behavior. It feels like, I mean, it's overwhelming for, for like a lay person for me, just for a pet guardian. Just like, what do I do? Do I, do I speak to a behavior consultant? Do I speak to a vet? Do I speak to a behavior vet? <laughs> Can I even speak to a behavior vet? Um, do, we, do we try probiotics? Do we try behavior meds? Do we try pain meds? How do we diagnose pain? Um, and I think that a lot of that, um, I mean, I feel really privileged that I'm able to explore all of those options. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people aren't, especially right now, because so many people feeling really, really sad and lonely during the pandemic got yeah. puppies. Um, and now there are for, you know, a number of different reasons, whether it's backyard breeding, whether it's um, uh, isolation during the pandemic and poor socialization or, or whatever the case may be, there are so many dogs with, um, behavioral challenges, families with behavioral challenges that maybe don't have access to the resources they need to. If there was one thing um, that you would recommend for people that like, we have, we have one option, we can't afford or we don't have the resources to explore all of them. What would be the one thing that you might recommend a person um, try? I think, I think the key thing is, is deciding what you need from your dog your dog does not need to be perfect so i think you don't need to tackle all of your challenges don't aim for perfection it's completely pointless a because you don't get there and b you don't need it so i think really it's about making your family life with your pet happy and safe that's all you need doesn't matter what anyone else thinks doesn't matter what your dog can do or not do if you can live in a way that's safe and happy for everyone in your family unit and you're not posing a risk to the public, that's all you need. So I think that's what you should really, really be focusing on. Um, I think when we think about, you know, where do we go first, you know, say if we're in a position where we can reach out and get professional help, I always start with your vet, start with your primary care vet. Because there are so many problems that are exacerbated by ill health. And yeah. as you say, you can spend lots of money on a trainer or a behaviorist. If they're not working well as a team with your primary care vet, or you've not, you know, your vet's not involved, you may miss some really important things and ultimately you'll waste your time and money. Um, so I think really it's focusing on how to help your pets as they reach that point where they can safely and happily coexist with everyone. I often start my kind of chat with people, particularly if they've dealt and trained with lots of people before, by sort of saying, I don't really do dog training, which feels like a weird thing to say. And of course there will be some dog training involved, <laughs> but I really don't care for obedience. It's really not interested in it. Um, we'll do some basic training, but, Ultimately, this is more like a uh, family counseling. <laughs> this is kind of, you know, who needs what? What are you struggling to communicate with each other? How can we make sure everyone's happy? Um, and, you know, like, um, I know some of your previous, you know, um, guests have commented on and things, it's about why is that behavior occurring? Let's focus on it at source. And if you can address that, the behavioral symptoms that you're seeing will get less. And then either you might decide actually they're fine now and you don't need to do anything extra yeah. or you may just feel like they're not quite so insurmountable. And actually now it's now we've taken the edge off. Yes, I can work on their reactivity to other dogs or now 50 percent of the problems are manageable. I actually feel like I've got the time and energy to deal with those that still need work and need more specific really? training. Yeah. Um, but really, we want to be focusing at source, at the root. Why is this happening? Otherwise, we just end up here and there and everywhere, and you just run out of steam. Um, it's totally overwhelming. Yeah. yeah, and I think if there are still problems, how important are they? As I say, like we mentioned before, if there's some stuff that you can stop it getting any worse and everyone's safe and happy, but ideally you'd like it to be different, if, you, if that's not your priority right now, Stick it on the shelf, come back to it later. Some of our pets are always gonna be project pets and there'll always be something on that shelf that when you think you've finished, you can go and get something else to work on. But it's okay to take a rest. You don't have to be progressing all the time. As long as you can manage them and stop them deteriorating, 
then you need to be able to work on things in the long run, particularly say for a lot of the animals I deal with, owners need long term kind of perseverance and energy. And you're not going to be able to maintain that frantic training, every different behavior every day forever. That's not going to work. Yeah, that's a lot. And I was just going to say how relatable a thought is that like we're all works in progress, right? We just need a little bit of progress to keep us going. Um, It's not about tackling everything all at once. It's about taking that edge off and working bit by bit so that we can all sort of coexist peacefully and happily and uh, be fulfilled without losing our damn minds in a crazy world. Yeah. And I often find that um, clients kind of problem list at the beginning you often get to the end and they're like, I say the end, obviously it's not the end, but the end of our kind of initial period together. And they're like, oh, everything's, everything's really good. I'm really happy. And you're like, okay, cool. Has this got better? Yeah, that's better. What about this? No, that's, that's the same. <laughs> what about this? Uh, it's a bit better. So, yeah. and actually the things that they were really bothered about at the beginning, their relationship and their understanding of the dog and everything is improved and they are happier and they're not as stressed, the person yeah. and the dog, So actually, those things that they found really annoying at the beginning, they don't really care about anymore. So yeah, I mean, the dog might dig a hole in the garden, but no. And I think that's the thing. It's people often when you're stressed, you know, just like our dogs, when you're stressed and you can't cope, you just find everything really irritating. And then once you're in a better place, you start to realise that those things don't really matter. Like, as you know, ultimately, as long as the dog is happy and they're not trying to eat anyone or causing huge stress to anyone, so what if they bark a bit or they occasionally chew the furniture? Um, our tolerances for our pets improve a lot when we've improved and worked on our relationship. And um, I think that's really, really important. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. That's beautiful. Um, I have so enjoyed chatting with you and I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, I'd love to do this again at some point. I know that um, you are trying to raise awareness and money for a very special cause. So if you want to talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, sure. That'd be great. Thank you. So as I mentioned, I'm a trustee for the Animal Behaviour and Training Council. So we're a charity based in the UK and we work along with a huge array of other behavior and welfare charities. Um, hopefully, so, maybe if we pop a link in the show notes, but you can have a look on there and see who's included. Okay, hey, sorry um, to stop you guys. And uh, I, ultim- have, I have a. That's right. I have like five minutes left. I'm getting the um, the notice again. Could we could we stop uh, start the meeting again, and then you can go into the uh, the charity organization just so we can get the full recording and, and give you enough time yeah. to explain all that. Okay. Um, I'm going to send an invite right now. Cool, that's fine. Okay. 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 We'll we'll pop that. So as I mentioned previously, I'm a trustee for the Animal Behaviour and Training Council, um, which is a charity in um, the UK, um, so England, Wales and Scotland. We're a registered charity. Um, Our aims are to promote humane practice in the training and behaviour therapy of animals. Um, and to lobby for improvements in animal welfare related to behavior of training and behavior modification of those animals. So we help regulate, we want to be working more towards regulation of um, training and behavior professionals. So that might be veterinary behaviorists, clinical animal behaviorists, animal trainers. We've got a number of registers. Um, We do that by working with a number of um, practitioner organizations. So um, they're the group that you actually are kind of a member of. So like the Karen Pryor Academy, um, APBC, um, lots of different groups. Um, You're a member of them and you're assessed by them um, to meet our standards, basically, and then you go on our registers. But the AVTC also acts as sort of a... um, spokes person spokes body for everyone so we say we want to try and work on improvements in animal welfare related to behavior and training so for example we partake in lots of um working groups and um panels discussing lots of issues so particularly big at the moment is about um potential uh, bans on e-collars and shop collars in the uk So we will present the information that we have um, and explain why we think they should be banned. Um, The ABTC only only allows practitioners to join them if they have adequate um, kind of science-based education and practices. So no aversive methods, 
definitely no positive punishment methods um, and it should all be based on essentially kind ethical and science based non punitive training and behavior modification. Um, but as I say we're a charity, so we try and really spread our awareness about ourselves we want to try and do lots of um, events like with the veterinary community, because one of the areas we're really wanting to um, work on is making sure that all the vets and all the nurses, you know, know that who we are, know who to recommend to their clients, make sure they go to the ABTC to find their trainers to run their parties, to find their behaviours to refer to, etc. cetera. Um, and I think like we've touched on lots of times that work between veterinary communities and behavior communities is so important mm -hmm. but going to all these kind of events and conferences is expensive <laughs> so you know the more money we can generate essentially the more work we can do we work with lots of people like the rspca dogs trust cats protection um we work with equine charities but lots and lots of different charities that's uh, kind of supporting and advisory members so there's huge amounts of information and knowledge that are going into this kind of decision making You'll also find information about how you can um, work towards a career as an ABTC registered practitioner. Cool. Um, and of course, if you need a practitioner, you can find the register on there of how to find um, someone near you. And what practitioner would suit you best? You know, what is your problem? Do you need a veterinary behaviorist? Do you need an animal trainer? Who do you need? You'll find all the information on that. Very, very cool. Thank you so much for sharing your wealth of knowledge and taking time out of your busy day to have this super fascinating conversation with me. I learned a ton um, and I still have so, so many more questions. So perhaps in another week or two after people have had the opportunity to watch this, um, if we get some questions, we can go live, something like that and um, answer yeah, some of the questions live. Awesome. Yeah, certainly. Um, if the dogs are like, yeah, the background. Yeah. Exactly. I like your enthusiasm. Um, yeah, definitely. I'm always happy to talk about behavior. And you've saved me from eating any more chocolate being Easter weekend. You've given me a break <laughs> from chocolate munching. So that's always good. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much again. And uh, I look forward to talking to you very, very soon. That's fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. Bye, Sophie. Bye. Subscribe. <laughs>